Hello, everybody out there in UK on Butland who just been to talk about the latest book, um, The Perfect Lie. It's in the middle of the covers in the middle, and I'm going to open up by asking Joe to talk about the plot, please. What can we say about the plot? <laughs> um, it, it, it's basically we meet this Irish emigrant called Erin Kennedy, and she's living this very lovely life over in Long Island. Um, she had a family tragedy back home in Ireland and she emigrated to the States, first New York. And then she met this really gorgeous, handsome detective called Danny and moved with him to Long Island. So when we meet her, she seems to be having this perfect morning. And I think most people are coming to this thinking she's the wife of a detective. It's gonna be a crime story told from the perspective of, of her as his wife. But she opens the door one morning to Danny's detective colleagues and behind her, Danny walks to the window of their fourth floor apartment and jumps to his debt. We flash forward 18 months and Erin is in court and she's been charged with the murder of her husband. And over the course of those 18 months, basically, we learn that there are an awful lot of things going on with Danny that Erin didn't know about and an awful lot of things in Erin's life that we don't know about. And it's just how we came to that point where she's in court charged with this heinous crime. So it kind of, I mean, the themes of the novel are pretty much how much you know the person you're living with and married to. Um, it really looks at the American judicial system. There's a lot of courtroom drama in the novel. And it, 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 it's just a kind of domestic psychological, I mean, there's a lot going on. There's, a, there's a, another layer of a story where we meet two students in Harvard and something really awful has happened yeah. to one of those girls, but we don't quite know what until halfway yeah. through the novel when it all starts to be pieced together. Um, so that's that's as much as I can say. I think whatever. Yeah, that's that's a, twist. <laughs> that's a yeah, pretty yeah. Yeah, um, I'm trying to think of a way of. Yeah, that's a pretty good summary of it, and um, that's a ra rather dramatic beginning. Uh, yeah, you know, with the window and everything. Um, what would you say you have to you have to work on to get? Um, dramatic starts like that because it must be different versus a standalone or a series it's it is a strange one i've been very lucky with the standalones that the the important part of the idea has arrived with me unasked for you know that those those little plot devices just arrive in my head so the opening two chapters the perfect lie kind of just came to me that kind of nutshell of an idea and it was the same with the confession which i did a few, few years ago and um, that's where a married couple are just watching TV and a guy walks in, pretty much beats the husband to death with a golf club and then hands himself into the local police station and says, I've just done this, didn't know the guy, I've had a psychotic episode. And each time those ideas have come to me, the problem has been the follow up to the ideas. <laughs> so what I, what I have to work on is I, I get this great kind of idea for an opening for a book. And then I have, I can't figure out why that has happened. Like, yeah. why is Erin in court charged with the murder of her husband? I, like, I, I knew I knew so clearly how the book was going to open, but absolutely nothing after that. So, I tend to leave them in the back of my mind, and I wait. I just, I just, you know, I, I go on runs, I go on walks, and sometimes I fall asleep at night. But all the time in the back of my head, I'm thinking, what if, what if, what if, and running through the possible scenarios that would make that plot work. And then when it eventually comes to me, I'll sit down and I'll just kind of outline a very loose kind of start, middle and end of that book, like kind of a chapter by chapter. It'll be about seven or eight pages. And if it works there, if there's no kind of plot holes there, that's when I'll start writing the book. So I'm, I'm lucky. I don't have to think about the plot or at least that plot selling point, the hook. But I do have to really work very hard to piece it together. <laughs> Hopefully not. Hopefully the readers don't have to work as hard as I do to, to figure it out. Um, have you learned? Have you learned anything from your TV writing that you've take, taken into your books? I, I think I switch between the both. Actually, I, the, you take something from both of them. Um, I mean, with TV, TV industry can be kind of dismissive of the book industry and authors. And at the same time, nearly most of the TV that I'm seeing made nowadays is comes from the genesis of a book. You know, they're optioning books left, right and centre because yeah. there's not a whole lot of original thinking in the world. And I think there's a huge respect for the publishing industry that it goes out and finds the original thinking because that's not how the TV industry works. The TV industry 
kind of wants to be told there's something safe before they'll invest there. And it is a large amount of money, so you can kind of understand mm -hmm. it. Um, the difference then between TV and books is that, I mean, publishers can put out millions and millions of books every year. And I, I think this is what's contributing to affecting authors earning so much. Like the authors don't earn an awful lot from the books and the publishers aren't taking that big a risk. Producers can't do that. Even the, even the cheapest TV show is going to cost millions. So producers need to make hits. So when you do a script for TV, it has to go through so many layers to get to the top of the slush pile with the broadcasters and it has to be of a standard. And it, it, it does amaze me that so much rubbish TV gets made because it's so hard to get TV made. Um, but in terms of the writing style, like I, TV is show, don't tell. Um, books can be very, you know, you can say everything you want in a book. You yeah. don't have to show anything. But sometimes I think people fall victim to exposition there. So, you know, you might get to the end of a book and there's a detective sitting with a suspect and the suspect is saying, oh, I'll tell you how I did this now over the course of the next two chapters. And you'll never, ever get away with that on TV unless you're writing a fantastic Jed Mercurio line of duty scene and that, you know, the, the one where they do the interviews. Most of the time in TV, you've got to show what's happened. It can't all be revealed in a, a confessional. So I've brought that to books, I think, where you should see what's coming in my books. And by the time you get to the end of the books, you should know how we got there. And it doesn't need an expositional chapter to explain what's happened, which I think it helps to increase the pace of the novels that I'm writing now. It's definitely, it definitely worked in the ones I've read. I mean, Six Wicked Reasons was um, quite, quite a tight lot of characters on all on a boat. That must be quite similar to TV with the, with when you're putting the scene together, which when they're all in the same place. Yeah, well, you know, one of the fundamentals of screenwriting is that you never have characters that you, you don't want to be having to hire paid extras for your TV show. So if you go to a network and you say, I've got a new show and there's um, 20 lead characters, <laughs> they're just going to laugh and say, oh, no, not going to happen. Like, oh, and in one of the scenes, it's, it's parade on St. Patrick's Day and they're just, you know, going to throw you out of the window at that point. <laughs> um, but in on books, you know, you can have millions of characters and but at the same time, you can introduce a character and if they've no relevance to the story and they don't come back. I think I'm at the point of my writing, which again probably comes from TV, where I'm like, well, there's, if there's no need for them, don't have them. You know, like if they're not central to the plot. Like, so if you can keep your cast kind of small and they're all important and they're all driving forward the plot. And if you see anyone in the background, they're what I like to call the in novels and on screen, they're unpaid extras. You know, they're just people who are, are there, they're not special extras. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah, the more I talk to you, the more I'm realizing TV really affects how I write books now. <laughs> well, it, it makes it makes sense because I think the smaller the cast, the um, easier it is for the readers to try and work it out, and you have to you have to be more um, challenging with the plot. So yeah. So how do you manage to um, make sure that stay challenging with small cast? And, and that's hard. And with the likes of Six Wicked Reasons, where there are essentially the clues in the name, <laughs> there's six <laughs> suspects. <laughs> um, and each of them had a, a wicked reason for doing away with the, the patriarch of the family, Fraser Latimer, you know. And over the course, yeah, I mean, over the course of a 400 page book, I mean, I think the trick is to, to introduce everybody as a suspect and rule them out and introduce them again and keep people on their toes where you're never quite sure. And, and a reader who's really taught, an author who's taught about what they're doing and an author who reads an awful lot, like I do, and a lot of crime authors do, is aware of how readers think. So yeah. I know when I'm doing something with a, a character, when I want you to think that that character has done something, I can't be too obvious because most crime readers are very intelligent, right? Like, yeah. You know, they, they, they are Miss Marple when they're reading these books, they're working out the crimes themselves. So I want them to feel that they've worked it out in, the, in a clever way and then pull the rug out from underneath them. And when you're working with six characters like that, that that's pretty difficult. And it's the same with The Perfect Lie. I mean, she, there's only so many things that are going to happen in the past that would lead us yeah. to this bizarre scenario. And I am trying to keep cover over the, the reveal for the best part of that book. Yeah. And I really, really stressed about it. You know, I read that book back so many times in edits to make sure I hadn't given anything away. But to me, to me, it's absolutely obvious. 
absolutely yeah. awful. so i'm always shocked now when people read it and say i didn't see that coming <laughs> well i did start reading it in a rather unusual way because when it came from the publishers um i did, didn't download it from the email so i was reading it and it came out and chat so the first chapter i read was actually chapter 10 so it didn't give anything away <laughs> and then and then i downloaded it and it played it in the right order so um for the first day i had to work out where all the chapters were and uh, so at the same time you were moving around the time zones i was moving around as well so it was quite interesting to see it's, it's a tough book because I, I there's yeah. a thing that they do on the sunday times crime club and um, it's called page 99 i think and apparently some literary critic said you can tell the book's quality by just taking page 99 and printing it and when i saw that they'd done this like my heart started palpating because i was like oh, oh god what's on page 99 <laughs> <laughs> what have i inadvertently given away you know but weirdly it's a really insightful page into the book because um erin meets with danny's detective partner uh, so this is after, you know, we've seen Danny jump to his death um, yeah. and in the present she meets with his partner and says, you know, what could Danny possibly have done that he would want to jump to his death for, you know, like he wasn't corrupt. And the partner says, you know, you of all people know that Danny had secrets. And that's pretty much yeah. all the page says. And I was like, oh, well, that, God, that's yeah, not that's that's very a, wrong. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's a pretty um, lucky page to not not reveal anything on yeah yeah <laughs> um it's qu quite interesting the start of your career though because it relied a lot on tv because it started with the richard and judy search for a search for a, um what it, search, was it search for it's a best seller um, yeah so what was that like yeah starting, starting i mean like it was, it, people still ask me how to get published and i always say I'm, I'm the worst person to ask or i'm probably the best person to ask because i can't tell you how to do it the traditional route because i didn't do it the traditional route and i had expected to do it like that and to receive multiple rejection letters and you know i have to keep picking myself up from the jaws of defeat and lurching from one failure to the next as churchill would say but what i actually did was i submitted it to this competition um, by chance and I remember saying to my husband will I send this book in and he said is it free <laughs> and now I, I often wondered afterwards if it had been a tenor entry with the course of my life being different you know um, so I sent it in didn't think anything more about it because competition's competition and I you know I know I've never won competitions and I polished the book and shortly after I got an email saying um, months after to be fair it's it's been shortlisted as one of our finalists um, there was thousands and thousands of entrants. I hadn't been genre specific. The competition was just search for a bestseller. It wasn't crime or anything. And they picked yeah. um, Tracy Reese, who written a wonderful historical kind of um, romance drama. But my publisher, really strong on crime, because they did The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. And my editor now rang me up and said, we, we really love crime. We love this book. And we're going to offer you a two book deal, which was shocking. Like no agent. It was the first, they were the first people who'd ever read that book. It was Quirkus. I'm still with Quirkus now. They're publishing my yeah. 11th book next year and I'm about to sign another contract with them. Um, and they're, 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 just, they're just fantastic, you know. So they nurtured that career all along the way. Um, but it, it was it was a bizarre entry into it. And people always say, you're so lucky. And I'm like, it, it, there are ways. If you want to get published, there are ways in. But that doesn't mean I'm not used to rejection. You know, like you get published in one territory, so I'm published in Britain and Ireland, and then suddenly it builds up and it goes out and I've got lots of translations and everything, but the US for me is hit and miss. You know, I've had a few books published in America and then other publishers have turned down books, you know, so, yeah. and then if you don't get a number one with one of your books, you know, it's all kind of layers of rejection <laughs> along the way, you know, so when people say you're so lucky, I think, no. I just keep trying. <laughs> I just keep trying to get that real big breakout novel. And I've been lucky to kind of find a lot of good readers along the way who like the writing and keep coming back and they keep me in pocket, basically. Yeah. So what when you break out novel in other territories and um, what's the biggest other territory that you sat in? Well, I mean, I, I'm bizarrely big in Russia. <laughs> that. 
um, I, I don't know what's going on with the Russians. They published Dirty Little Secrets last year, and last I heard, they were on their fourth print run, which is unheard yeah. of in the space of seven or eight months. Um, and they just published Six Wicked Reasons. Um, I sell really well in Croatia and Holland, and a, a good few countries have bought the first in the Tom series, like in Sweden. And I, I was nominated. Um, it's not, I can't remember what it's called now, but it was formerly the Martin Beck Award in Sweden. So it's a really prestigious award. Um, yeah. It was nominated for the International Book of the Year there, you know. So I've done really, and I do well in Australian New Zealand as well. But um, I've had I've had great reviews everywhere, but it's, it's I'm not published everywhere. You know, like I don't have books in Spain yeah. or books in Italy, places like that, you know. So it is, I, I think becoming a long-term author is a long-term job. You know, it does happen for some people overnight, but for other authors, you've got to work with it. Yeah, and keep I, was listening, books. I was listening to your interview with the Blood Brothers podcast, and you were saying about how up and down it is um, compared to compared to what it's like in film, and um, how how um, you think that um, lots of authors uh, like. Like the idea of getting into telly, but it's not as easy as you think. Yeah, um, I, I'm, I'm quite open and honest about this. TV is where the money is. Um, I'm not going to lie, like, it, it, it's different. It's night and day, writing novels and writing for TV. It's also where the egos are, because where there's money, there's ego. Um, and it's a, it's a tough business to be in, because when I write a novel, so that's my, it's my favourite form of writing, because it's my idea. It's my story, then my words. I write it, I'll talk to my editor, I'll talk to my husband who reads four straps, I'll talk to my agent, um, and then I'll polish it until I'm happy with it. It's always me. With a, with a script, I write it. Uh, the producers tell me how to fix it, or, or a co-writer. But then the ghost of broadcasters, they tell me how to fix it too, and what they want. And it, it's, not, it's not just fixing, it's what they want. You know, they, they're putting the money into the show. The director comes on board, the director of photography comes on board, the, the cameramen, the line producers, then the actors. It goes on and on and on. It's a collaborative script by the time it's finished. And this is this is an ongoing process. And even before you're filming, like I, I finished a, what we call a treatment of a show last January. And I opened my email today and they've sent more notes. <laughs> <laughs> it's me and I'm like, <laughs> I, I normally write a book like once I've thought about the book and I sat down and wrote it I'd write it in a month and um, I might edit it for three or four months but given that the book is out that year everything is constantly being turned around in 12 month cycles um whereas with tv you know you can feel like you've been working on something for four years <laughs> it, just, it just never ends Alex it never ends how do you find what's a signal for help <laughs> <laughs> yeah how do you find the challenge of writing books and TV at the same time? And how do you find the space to do so? I, it's it's definitely tiring. Um, when I started writing TV, I was writing two books a year. One one time around, I was on one standalone. Uh, I'm down to one book a year now because it's it's just not on impossible to keep up that kind of productivity rate. Yeah, um, yeah. Which is is upsetting a lot of people because Tom has got a lot of fans, and I love that. But I and I do feel like I'm holding her ransom in my head, but I can't I physically can't find the time to do a Tom because I mean, I've four children as well at home. So we're, we're trying to move house too, which everybody knows is a, a nightmare scenario. Um, so, I mean, I guess I am aware that these years are good opportunity years for me um, and really nice years for earning because you can have lean years in TV. You know, like I've producers coming to me all the time at the moment because I'm filming and offering me jobs. And I could go to a patch where I have a really bad show and people aren't offering me jobs. So you kind of have to take the work when you get it, you know? Yeah. Um, but it does mean I'm balancing. I'll, I'll, I always have a novel on the go. Like at the moment, I have copy edits coming on the novel due for next year. And I just pitched the novel for the year after. And at some point at the end of this year, I've got to write that novel for the year after. And there's always stages of a novel then, edits and copy edits and proofs. And, and then even when the novel is released, you've got all the PR. So I've been doing weeks of PR for The Perfect Lie. So it, it, they're both full-time jobs. Doing yeah. Zoom together is not advisable. Um, when, when looking at a series, you said you've not done a time for a while. Do you find it easier to do standalones 
when you're looking at writing TV? Or is there, is there a reason that you've not done the Tom for a while? I think, I mean, I the last time I did actually came out last August. So when I say I haven't done one for a while, what I mean is I don't have one ready to go next. I don't have Tom 7. Yeah. So that was the six in the series. Um, there is a, standalones, to be completely honest, are doing better internationally than the Toms. Um, so Toms do really well in Ireland and they've grown fan base in Britain. Um, and they've, they've done well in, in some territories around the world, but they're, they're so far behind. The fact that six means they could be publishing for a couple of years before they catch up. The standalones get instant success. And I guess like what authors have to say to readers and probably don't say enough is that unless your books are selling, you can't keep writing books. You know, like I, yeah. there's probably some authors who just maybe write for the fun of it. But if you're doing it full time, you've got a product and it's like a, a painter who keeps painting art. They need the art to sell so they can keep painting the art or they need somebody investing in them, you know. Um, yeah. So my standalone novels do really well. And they're the ones I'm concentrating on now. And, and they are easy to kind of pick up and put down because they just, as they, you know, they stand on their own. Whereas with the series, you're constantly thinking about not just the plot of that, but also the detectives' lives and how you're going to bring them on and the drama arcs of those characters. Yeah. So for the foreseeable, I think you'll be back when I have more time. Um, but for yeah. the foreseeable, it's, we're stuck with standards. How much um, revisiting do you have to do for the series? Say that I miss you, Alex, sir. How much revisiting do you have to do for the series books? Uh, I mean, I, 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 I forgot, I've got a really good editor in Quirkus, and it's funny, she's an American girl called Sharona. And sometimes when I write a Tom, I get them wrong. <laughs> I get characters' names wrong and ages wrong, because it might have been two books since I last wrote one. And I remember on the last one, she actually said to me, um, so Tom's granddaughter, Koch, People are always asking me how to pronounce that, and I'm like, it's C-A father I-T, it's the Irish for Kate, so it's Koch. Um, and I, I don't know what age I had her at, but it was wrong. And Sharona got on to me and said, um, I have checked, I've checked in the, the appendix of Tom, and she's actually such and such an age. And I was like, well, I have you. Um, could you tell me who Michael's married to? <laughs> <laughs> so she's kind of a repository of information on all things Tom Reynolds, which, which means like, I, I've got these books on my bookshelf and normally I'll just skim through trying to find, because I don't, I never built um, like a, a brain thing on the computer. I never put in the details of all these characters. I just wrote them as I wrote them. And because I tend to remember stuff generally, I'm generally okay. Yeah. But since I did that first time, I mean, on any given, right now I'm working on, I think it's 12 TV projects and every project has got a cast of characters. I have this book out, I have the next book done, I'm thinking about the following book. So I've hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of names and ages and biographies and situations and locations in my brain at any yeah. given time. So were I to write another Tom again now, I think I'd just ring Sharona and say, where does he live? <laughs> yeah. 12 projects like that must be quite quite a challenge. I mean, you, you were saying that you got um, one that you were writing. I think it's a, um, some, it's a Iceland summer snowy or something. You said before it came on. That's a, well, there's one in Iceland that's kind of dystopian, but the one you're thinking of is um, one in Lapland. And yeah. incidentally, I've set the next novel in Lapland as well, because I was over there last year just before COVID hit on a location shoot. So we were looking, you know, where we were going to be filming this um, before everything hit and slowed everything down. Um, and when I was there, I just thought this is... So the, so the TV show was kind of like, it's, it's Fargo meets Killing Eve, and it's, it's kind of humour and craziness and absolute insanity. So there's a bit of a whodunit element to it, but it's, it's more like action, fast-paced. And when I was in Lapland, I thought I'm definitely going to write a novel set here because the place is just fascinating. Like it's freezing, so cold. You, you can't you can't begin to. And I remember being there and it was something like, I don't know, minus 1000 degrees is how I felt it to be. And they were like, yeah, it's kind of balmy. <laughs> it's not that cold. I was like, no, really, it's cold. My, my bra, I can't even see anymore. Like I had icicles on my eyelashes. Yeah. Um, and I was thinking it's it's a chilling place and when you set a crime there then because it's so beautiful and I've always had that that image of blood on snow you know it's, it's a really visceral image that kind of red splashes of blood on that kind of expanse of white snow and I was thinking this is where my next murder mystery is going to be 
So I'm, I'm absolutely obsessed. I've been in Finland and Lapland now a good few times. And I'll be there a lot more by the time we finish this show. <laughs> how, how do you cope with the fact that the sun doesn't go down as often in there with the like insomnia and stuff? But that, that was a big film for me. Um, yeah, yeah. Maybe I mean, it's, I wasn't there in the because I've always been there in the winter, which it brings it's a different kind of challenge. The sun barely comes up, and um, so they are constantly like mainline in vitamin D. Um, I remember thinking like when I arrived there, just it felt like perpetual night. Like it's kind of gloomy even when it's daytime, yeah. you know. And there'd only be a couple of hours of sun for want of a better word. Um, but I remember thinking, how are we going to film this? Because I'm so used to filming in Ireland and Britain and the cameramen are constantly trying to film things in, in daylight, you know, because it's cheaper and it's easier than doing it at night because once you get into nighttime filming, you're paying overtime and you're having to set up floodlights and, you know, even to make something look, look dark at nighttime, you've got to have millions of floodlights just to shoot the thing. And when we arrived in Lapland, which is, you know, it's where the Arctic Circle starts in Novo Niemi, um, so they might have two hours of daylight during the winter, which is incidentally when we set the show. And I was like, this is going to cost millions just to light. And they were like, yeah, yeah, we're used to it, we're used to it. Yeah. And then they said, we'll, we'll do this one and we'll do season two then in the summer when the sun never sets. I was like, oh, okay, yeah. okay, you're messing with my brain now, you know? <laughs> I can't go from one to the other. Um, what, what, when you were there, what, what was it about that that made you decide to write there? I mean, it must, must be great going around all different parts of the world are they your inspiration for new ideas as you say yeah i i i pretty much put everywhere i've been into a novel and um, so with the perfect lie um well that that went badly wrong on me because i'm i've been in new york a good few times I and mean, when I decided to send Erin over there, um, I thought, I'll, but I'll, I'll move around New York and I'll send her somewhere really idyllic where the wealthy live, where, you know, nothing too bad ever happens. I'll send her to Long Island and I thought I'll come back here now and spend a bit of time, you know, doing the research that authors do. And then I could, couldn't get on a plane in Dublin, like for over a year and still can't. So that never happened. So I had to write the perfect lie just pretty much on Google Maps and research. And, and, and luckily I'm familiar enough with, you know the area from books yeah. and screen and i kept reading nelson demille's because he's phenomenal on long island um but everywhere i've been now at this stage it sticks with good reasons when i mentioned paris when i mentioned Le Mans and new york i'd been in all those places within a year before i wrote that book and i find anywhere i am if i if i love a place i can write about it well you know, like if I don't like a place, I I, well, I don't want to revisit it, so I won't. Um, but anywhere I've been that I enjoy, I want to put it on the page. And for years, the Tom Reynolds were only set in Ireland, so I didn't get to do that until the very final Tom. Um, I thought, you know what, I'm just going to send him on a kind of a, a bit of a holiday. <laughs> but yeah. It was part of the case, but I, I just come back from um, Newcastle, where I've been on a tour with um, another author, William Shaw. So I, I sent Tom to Newcastle to liaise with the Newcastle police. But it's difficult when you're working with a, a detective who, when they leave their jurisdiction, has no power in another jurisdiction. So that's limited. But the standalones, I started I started off in Ireland, but quickly realized there's no shackles on me here. I can set this wherever I want and I can send them wherever I want. And that's been getting more yeah. and more as I've gone along. And I mean, I love writing about Ireland. I love Irish characters. And there's always, I mean, Aaron's an Irish character in America. And in The Perfect Lie, there's an Irish character there as well. But also, I, I'm used to writing British characters too. That's no big stretch for me, you know? So there'll always be those links. Um, but I think the book after The Drowning, which I, I shouldn't even be talking about this now, which just get people interested, which I pitched is set between a Caribbean island and London. <laughs> and my editor is starting to get wise to me now. And she's like, you just want to go there, don't you? <laughs> I was like, yeah. Oh, oh. Why not? Yeah, why not? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so, um, yeah. yeah any, anywhere you, anywhere you, if you follow me on Twitter or Facebook and I say I want to visit somewhere, chances are that place is ending up in a book. We we first met when you were on, on tour, Harry and at Lincoln. What's it like touring with another author? I mean, I've only had to do it once with one author, so I can say it's fantastic <laughs> because I really get on with William. Um, we had a fantastic time together. We, we were in lovely venues 
put up in lovely hotels, meeting really nice audiences. Like I've no bad tour stories. I've heard on the grapevine yeah. like that that's not the way it always happens. And like William's books are fantastic. So it was no great, you know, it wasn't an issue for me to read his books and enjoy his books and talk to him about his books the way he talked to me about my books. I guess if they paired me with somebody and I wasn't a fan of their writing, that could be awkward as hell, you know. Yeah. I mean, you, you wouldn't say it, obviously. You, you just go along and uh-huh. say, I, I love yeah. you. I'd have to read them for a start then to go on tour, you know. Um, but I think that would be an effort because you're, you know, we, we went on trains across England for days, myself and William, um, and I'm a terrible traveler. I get real motion sickness. And for a lot of those trains, like he was saying, do you need your hair held back? <laughs> That's how bad I get, you know? So we bonded over my desire to vomit on English trains. <laughs> but um, one, I think once you've, once you've had that kind of bonding experience, maybe all the rest of the tours are easy. <laughs> So do you find it difficult to write on tour or have you got used to it doing it because of the filming and stuff? I mean, I, well, I can do it like once I'm stationary <laughs> in a hotel yeah. bed or something. And the last tour I was on, I was having to work on a, a script, an episode for that Icelandic show. Um, and, and luckily, you know, we were early riders and early to bed because we'd so much traveling to do. So I was sitting kind of in the hotel room at my time, just catching up on script work. But then it's tiring because when you're on tour um, and even the likes of tonight when I'm doing a, an interview with yourself and I did some interviews today, you're, you have to be on, you know, like you, you have to talk about your work and, and you know, like you, you can't just say, well, I'm kind of tired now you speak, you know, like you're awake for the whole <laughs> thing and it's generally yeah. enjoyable, but it means when you're, when you're finished, um, I always find now when I finish a really good interview and people have asked me really certain questions like, like you are, I'm a bit kind of like, oh, tired my brain is tired you know? yeah. but when you're on yeah yeah no I, I get really I get tired of talking <laughs> I'm a writer like I, I talk with my hands really well but, but my mouth is <laughs> I'm not used to using this bit like <laughs> so um I, my brain just goes to shut down after the orators um and then when you have to work like it, I can't say to the film crew look you know I've got a PR tour for the perfect lie at the moment even though it's technically online um so I can't be in on set on any given day so that the, the when the perfect lie was released last Thursday, I was on set, and it was it was awful because there was very little Wi-Fi, and I had a day of people tweeting on Facebook and on Instagram and support for the book, and I want to reach yeah. out them and say thanks so much, and you know just just thanks for the lovely support. But I kept having to find these places, and at the same time, then when they're filming, it's like quiet on set, you know, it was just shocking, and I just wanted to be at home drinking champagne yeah. and toasting the release of a book I'd worked hard for, you know. Yeah. yeah on, on that note, I'd like to say thank you for filming the promo video and um, thank you to everybody at Quirkers for offering free um, five books to the group. Yeah, and uh, if you could um, just pop a comment in the thing and then you'll be eligible for the raffle, which, which uh, I'll do after the event and uh, then. Um, just publishers can send out um, to your addresses with the book. Um, yeah, um, it just be really nice to um, be able to do this. And thank you so much for um, helping us arrange that. Yeah, it's really nice. To be honest. I knew when we did our promo a few weeks ago that we enjoyed it. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, it's um it's nice to um be able to do that. But you were in the middle of filming at that at the time, and it was it must be really busy to try and fit all that in. And of course, it was before. I, the I, book. I, so, I remember that day actually. I just I just stayed home from set because I had so much Zoom, and I was like, I can't risk um being in the middle of a live broadcast and somebody roaring in the background, quiet on set, action. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I just stayed home. <laughs> but I, I got millions of PRs on that day because of that, so it wasn't too bad. Um, but look, yeah. it is what it is. I'm balancing them all like tentatively at the moment. So um, with, with um, you being at home, you were saying about the fact that you can only go in gardens at the minute. Um, 
But what have you got like planned for your your day off? Yeah. On Saturday, this amazing day off. <laughs> so I'm going to um we're we're meeting up with friends in their garden because they have a giant trampoline. Um and we have four children, they have two. And the weather forecast is rain, but we actually don't care. We're gonna bring raincoats and umbrellas and sit in their back garden and drink rain diluted wine while our children bounce together. <laughs> That's as exciting as it gets in Dublin right now. We're, we're so we, We've been in lockdown for so long over here. We're so far behind you guys that the prospect of even meeting up in somebody's back garden is so exciting for us that I probably seem ridiculous. <laughs> I'm happy to sit in the wine drink in the rain drink of wine. <laughs> no, it's not it's not ridiculous at all. I mean, as I, I spent um most of the day with, with my girlfriend. But um the challenge for me was I actually started lockdown a week before everybody else. Um, when when Boris announced it, I'd already been in lockdown, lockdown for a week, so it's been been mental for me. So, yeah, yeah, we just had a tricky time at Christmas when our my husband was a close contact, and they they'd opened the shops and the restaurants for like the month of December, and we spent two weeks in isolation, I mean, and none of us had it in the end, and that nearly killed me because it was kind of a brief window where we could go socialise and shop and, you know, that kind of thing, but actually we're just sitting in. Um, so I still haven't got over that, to be honest. Yeah, I must admit, it was a little bit awkward for me because one of the carers um, did catch it over the Christmas period, so it was after a month. Oh, God. Yeah. That's hard. Yeah, it's, it's uh, been a bit mental. But I must admit, um, the online book community has been great. What have you, what have you, um, you found over lockdown has been the most rewarding part of the year? I mean, I think, like, I've been kept pretty busy with work and stuff, so I haven't been really bored. I mean, I've been bored of not going out and things like that, and it's been tough having all the children here. But there's definitely... I had so much travel planned last year for the various film and things, and I'm absolutely terrified of flying, so I was not looking forward to it. I, I just like, and I'm a real homebird, I like being home with my family. And even that year that I met you in Harrogate, I brought my family over with me and we stayed in a house um, in Goisley, and I travelled up to Harrogate because I like having them with me. And I think what COVID was, did for me was it meant I didn't have to leave them because the nature of the TV industry is that you do have to leave your family quite a bit um, to be on set and to do location shoots and meet producers. And when you're not into that kind of lifestyle, I really do just like working at the computer and being home with my kids, which is why I started writing in the first place. So over lockdown, I had that arguably too much, <laughs> but, <laughs> but at least I was here, you know, and I, and I think yeah. a lot of parents feel like that, that they had, you know, it's kind of nice spending all that time with their families um, and not feeling the rush to, you know, do everything. And even when I'm home from work, to have to meet up with people at weekends and socialise all the time. And it'll probably stand to us. I mean, we'll appreciate when lockdown's lifted and we can socialise and we can go visit places and go on holidays. But, you know, things happen for a reason. So I, I have yeah. enjoyed spending more time with them. Yeah, it's definitely been... Um, what what have you, what have um would you spend more time with your family what what's been their influence on your books would you say um well i was only slagging mocking my daughter before i came on this because she hasn't read them yet and when she was very young so she's 15 nearly 16 when she was like 10 she wanted to read them all the time when my first book came out you know and i was saying no 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 it's too old for you um, and 11 and 12 is too old for you. And I think when she was about 14, I said, you can read my books now, but she had no interest in reading my <laughs> books then. So <laughs> I was saying like, yeah, this is all mommy does. And they couldn't watch my first TV show and they couldn't watch another show that I worked on. And um, they will be able to watch Harry Wilde, which is filming at the moment because it's, it's I mean, Jane Seymour is quite wild in it, but it, it's still watchable, I think, for, for my older kids anyhow. Um, <laughs> But I mean, my husband, like he's a former editor, so he reads all of my books, um, a lot of my scripts as well, and gives me feedback at the very early stage, because I call him kind of my benchmark. If he is figuring out a plot, um, I'll change the plot a little bit. 
or if he's completely lost and has no idea what's going on, I'll, I'll fix it. <laughs> like you, you, you have to, you can't over, you can't write over your readers. Your readers have to be able to understand what you're doing, you know? So he's there yeah. for that. Um, and then he helps at the end with proofs and things. If I'm stuck in a TV show, my editor would sometimes just send my proofs to my husband and say, can you take on that? You know, so, so physically he's a huge help for me. I mean, they haven't appeared in any books. He, he's, he's kind of Tom Reynolds in a way, my husband, because he's, I took a lot of his traits and put them into Tom. Like Tom loves wine, loves cigars, loves staying up late at night. He's, he's kind of wry, he's funny and he's smart. And that's my husband. Um, the, the kids as well will sometimes say something funny. Um, I'll take that in or like even in The Perfect Lie, one of the kids is um, playing Robux, which I for years taught were roadblocks. <laughs> so yeah. I deliberately put in that missing thing in there where she's, she doesn't have kids and she's going, why are they talking about Roblox? You know, because most parents make the same mistake. And um, so I, I do listen particularly more in the last year because I have had no one else to listen to and know where to go. Uh, they're little conversations. And if I'm writing any children, they'll, they'll feature. Um, but because my plots are so bonkers, I mean, I can't really say that my family features in them because we have a very strange family if they do. <laughs> <laughs> they, they are pretty un, unusual, but um, the, uh, you know, um, with, with, with the um, series versus standalones, I suppose they have to be quite different. Who would you say has been your... Um, Biggest writing influence. You said you read a lot of crime. Yeah, I mean, I, I go right back to the greats. I think I'm not a huge fan, actually, of her books, of her writing style, but I am a massive fan of her ability to plot Agatha Christie. Um, I, I mean, I just tend to, I like to write characters with more depth than I often feel that Agatha Christie, the characters are there to serve a purpose, and the purpose is the plot. Um, but our, the plots themselves are just ingenious. She's, I don't think she's ever been beaten. She's the queen of crime to me, you know. Um, and I, I, I do try to emulate that in terms of the plots that I come up with, you know, that they're really well put together and nobody feels cheated at the end, which is what she did so well, you know. Like in modern times, then, um, there's still authors that I read. And I, I've said it a few times now, I read this book called Alex by Pierre Lamette a few years ago. So Pierre Lamette, um, he's written a few books and they are just, I remember reading Alex and there's a twist in the middle of that book that knocked my socks off. And he's done it a few times in other books since. And I, I keep thinking when I grew up, I want to write like Pierre Lamette. <laughs> so it's, it's not so much that like, he influences me in terms of making me want to be a better writer. I want to kind of write to that level because he's such a genius, yeah. you know, and I, I think it's always good to read people who are better than you because if you're, you know, if you're reading people who aren't as good as you, you just sit back and feel kind of superior. And if you're reading people who are on level with you, you're not learning much and you're having an enjoyable tale, but you're probably not learning much. But if you're reading writers who are much better than you, then you're trying to rise. So Pierre Nemet is that writer for me. Still trying to crack his plot. <laughs> it's always um, challenging to, to try and uh, work out your kind of plot. I've um, uh, interview interviewing um, some some authors, and they've put their clues at the end of the books for people to track. Have you ever thought about doing that yourself? I'm not going to add any more layers. <laughs> I just think they're, they're like all of my clues are throughout the books. And even with this one, um, there's a reveal at the end of this book that I have given the readers the clues to throughout the book. You just have to go back and, yeah. and read it. Like, you know, it, it takes, I and mean, there's going to be some people just saying, what? No, that can't be right. But if you read the book again, knowing what you know, yeah. you'll see it is. You know, and, and that, that took yeah. a lot of work. Um, but it again it goes back to that thing of not cheating the reader at the end. Like the reader should never feel that in the very last chapter a detective just grabs somebody from the street and says, It was him. <laughs> the you know, yeah. it needs to be there in plain sight the whole way. And then at the end of it, like and I'm a reader too, I'll be very satisfied. Even if I see it coming, I'll be very satisfied if that's written very intelligently all the way through. Um, so that's what I try to do with plots, but I think, yeah, there's not going to be any 
treasure maps uh, put into the books. Yeah, I must admit, I don't mind if it's April and if it's well flooded. Yeah. Yeah, I feel the same. I feel the same. Um, and I do, I think we tend to, because we read so much, we're kind of behind the curtain. Like you do tend to see an yeah. awful lot of, that's why Pierre Lemet, like is, is such an inspiration to me because I don't see what he's doing. And that's very, very rare for me. Like in nearly every single book that I read, I can get inside the mind of the author and see what's coming. Um, so, but I don't mind that. that. That's, it's like a busman's holiday for me when I read a book, yeah. you know, I know how to write the book. So I, I know where the, that author is going to go. And even if they go a little different way, I can see why they went that way and go, oh, well done, well done. I appreciate that. You know, but that's just, it's just because we read so much, Alex. Yeah, you were saying before that um, you do, you're do you doing well on audio at the moment. Um, do you, why do you think that is? No. I, it's, it's, we didn't see it coming, I can tell you that much. Um, I mean, Dirty Little Secrets was number one for, I think, half the year on Audible last year. And I had multiple number ones then because, you know, sometimes something goes number one and other ones do as well. So Six Weeks Reads is a confession. And, um, and I see even now The Perfect Lie, which is at full price, is, is climbing rapidly up the Audible charts, you know. And I was wondering about it. I mean, I've, I've started writing better for Audible in the last couple of books because of the TV, I think, because I realise um, if you write a lot of dialogue and don't attribute the dialogue to anybody, that makes it hard for an, an Audible voiceover artist and an Audible listener to understand who is saying something in any given moment, unless the voiceover artist is putting on a different accent for each character. And if the dialogue is kind of fast paced, even if there's different accents, that's hard to do it at any kind of speed, you know? So I'm aware of the written word sounding very different when it's read. I've been aware of it for years because even when I go to an event and they ask me to read my first chapter, it can be really difficult to read aloud. It's not written to be read aloud, it's written to be read in your head. So I think it's been growing on me in the last couple of years where when I write something, I'm, I mean, I don't stop and read it because part of my brain translating that into how it will sound if it's set out. And obviously I think that's affecting the quality of my books now for Audible and, and it must be because they're selling so well. And people keep saying, I love listening to this book. And I know it's reading, but they're, they're listening to it like, and yeah. so long may it last because you know it's great so <laughs> i keep getting number ones if you had, if you uh would to choose to read an audio book because you said it's a generally a new experience to you um what book would you choose and why yeah that, that's a hard one. i mean i know a lot of people tend to choose them on the basis of the readers um like i've had people come to my books um the, the woman who's done a lot of my books, I've, I've had two women so far and a new woman for The Perfect Lie. So Sophie Jo Watson has done The Perfect Lie and, and she's getting rave reviews, so she's obviously great. But actually, um, the woman who'd been doing them up to date, Eve McMahon or Michelle Moran, they sometimes readers just aren't available. But I know people who buy all of the books just to hear their voices. They've, you know, I, yeah. I didn't realise how popular the Irish accent is. I, like I've got a North Side Dublin accent and to me, my accent is really harsh. And sometimes people say to me, you've a lovely accent. And I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> but the Irish accent seems to travel, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, I think what I might do, because um, I'm doing an interview with Audible actually in the next couple of weeks, um, part of it is to listen to an Audible book. And I don't, like I traditionally read, but like I, yeah. we were saying before we came on air, I'm, I'm thinking about going to Audible now for runs and walks. Um, and I might find one of my readers and listen to one of their other books, because I've never listened to it in my own books. Yeah on audible like i mean i listen to the samples of the the readers when they send them in um, and then pick them but i i don't read my own books and i don't listen to them because i don't want to know i'll just start editing them again yeah once they're gone for me, they're gone yeah. for me and so i might find one of those readers and listen to another book that they've narrated just to hear what they sound like <laughs> well one of the great irish voices um i've heard recently has got to be with with liz nagent's books because that's with five separate Irish voices, all narrated by different people. It's great. So that might be a good one to talk about with Audible. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, when I read all Liz's books, every time Liz yeah. releases a book, I either I kind of catch a proof or I'm forced in the shop buying it, so. <laughs> uh, yes, um, 
it's a very different book um, with the time switches and stuff. Um, when you when you um, get talking about books with your friends, what what do you what do you talk about with authors that you don't get asked by the public? Um, I don't know because we like when we when authors are talking, we tend to be talking about the books that we have just read that we really enjoyed reading. So it's it's very similar actually because authors are readers, you know. Like there's no yeah. um. I mean, the odd time now we might talk about the publishing experience, uh, which I think, you know, we got into a little bit here where I'm talking about how there's just so much more money in TV than there is in books, you know, and that's just something that would occupy authors' minds, but doesn't seem to translate to um, readers. And I'm sure why should it, you know, because when you buy a book, you're buying it for the story, you know, but people... I guess they don't know what goes on behind the court in the terms of the publishing industry, you know, whereas there's something that we'd be acutely aware of how difficult it yeah. is for authors to keep going um, in climates where people want to buy, really, they want to buy books for 99p on Kindle. Um, and it, 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 yeah. it, it really, I, I understand it. I understand, you know, if, if you can't buy books new, books can be expensive. Um, or if you don't have a library near you, you know, and if you read an awful lot, I do get that tourist for books. At the same time, if you're getting a book for 99p and you translate what that author has had to do to write that book, you know, um, and you're then going and spending 2 99 on a copy. You know? <laughs> That's the kind of thing that authors yeah. talk about, you know. Um, but more often than not, we just actually slip into talking about books because we're all sent so many books all the time. And we see books ahead of time. So we see an awful lot of the proofs that come out. And we kind of know, we, we can hear the industry excitement building up for a book that's coming. And everyone, we'd be saying, yeah. like, have you got a hold of that book? Like, you know, do you get it when you give it to me? You know, because we're, we're as excited as the next person to see what the big hit's going to be, you know. And I think I've read every big book of the last couple of years that's come out, you know. And then I, I'd like to find out as well, if I meet an author from another country that I'm not really familiar with, I'd be yeah. quizzing them on, so who's really big in your country? Like, who was big in the 80s? Who was big in the 90s? So I can go back and find their books like and I've been reading over lockdown books from Japan and South Africa and you know just having those kind of little mind holidays where you go to those places oh. and it's a crime fiction novel yeah at the same time you're somewhere different and you're learning something new you know um so yeah we're 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 fairly normal that's the kind of thing we talk about we definitely definitely don't talk about killing people I love I love um reading books from other countries um what would you say is uh other country that you've read about that you'd like to go to? Um, sometimes, like, they're real countries, but then sometimes they're fictional places. Like, I, I was a big fan of Louise Penny's um, series for years, and she sets it in a fictional village called Three Pines. I, I mean, you, you wouldn't live in Three Pines, i say that much, mm. because somebody dies <laughs> every couple of months. It's a bit like Brookside, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's described really, really nicely. And there's this little coffee shop, and they're always in there having the freshly toasted baguettes and the brie and the, the big steaming bowls of coffee. And it's kind of like in, in French Quebec, you know? Um, so I've often thought, like, that would be a lovely place to go. But I've never been to Canada. So I'm uh, she's Canadian, and I'm assuming she's basing even her fictional um book and and situation on places that she knows you know so i think canada appeals to me um but i also because now i've written about long island and the perfect law you need to go to long island <laughs> just i i like created a fictional town just so i wouldn't get it wrong but a lot of the places that she visits yeah. in the book are actual long island places and that was all true research so i think um if this manages to take off hopefully there'll be some kind of reader trail through Erin's home in Long Island, and I'd be sitting oh, there that, going, "Ooh, ooh, so where yeah. she lives." <laughs> That'd be a good excuse to go to Harvard, though. Have you, have you, have you uh, been there for your research, or did you have to Google everything? No, yeah, that that all has to be googled. Um, and also, I got really into watching the Gilmore Girls. <laughs> Because there's yeah. multiple series where she wants to go to Harvard, and I think she ends up in Yale. Uh, but I actually put that in to the book at one point. Yeah, I don't remember. Book, yeah. I think it's actually my editor saying, "Yeah, yeah, it's the first time I've seen the Gilmore Girls mentioned in crime fiction." Um, and I was saying, "Well, yeah, there, there's a reason for that." Like, <laughs> I was with Rory Gilmore trying to get into Harvard in my brain. <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah, it's it's that kind of leafy 
New England type university really appeals to me. So if I do get over there, that would be on the list as well of fictional places to visit that I made up for the perfect life. <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot of big, big TV universes. Uh, what what do you think you could uh, take from TV and translate into a book if you were asked? I know you do it. I know you do it the other way around. If somebody asked you to turn TV into to a book, which what would you? Which uh, TV show would you choose? Mm, that that's a that's a really hard one um, because I often think that the best TV shows have come from books, uh, but I think one of my favorite shows in the last few years, and I've had a couple, I don't know if they were based on books, they're probably based on some element of research, but Mindhunter on Netflix. So this is the one where the two FBI um, profilers, when they're setting up kind of FBI profiling as yeah. an expertise, they yeah. go around the States interviewing the serial killers, you know, the Ed Kempler and Manson and things yeah, like that. Yeah, I love the series. Um, and that was absolutely yeah, it was absolutely fascinating. And I, if it's not a book, that is an idea for a book that is absolutely, I, I would read that book, you know. Um, and then there's another Italian series called, there's three series of it, it's 1992, 1993, 1994. And it's set kind of in Silvio Berlusconi just before he comes to power Italy. And it was all about the politics and corruption and it's just crime, sex, lies, love, everything. And again, maybe that was based on a book originally because it's so brilliant. But if it's not, that's a whole period of Italy that I'd be fascinated in. Like I, I would either turn it into a book or read it if somebody did. That, that's a very interesting question. Alex. Nobody's ever, ever asked me that that way before. Well, I'll try to come up with new questions. Um, but let's go to an older one and say what's coming next for you because we're getting near the end now. So, I mean, The Drowning is not going to be, even though it's done, it's not coming out until September 2022, because essentially, yeah. The Perfect Lie is a summer read. Like it's set in a summer town. It's basically in and around summertime. The Drowning is Lapland. It's the depth of winter. It's, it's, it's a freezing cold book. Um, so we wanted to release it in a time period in a run up to Christmas and, and couldn't do it this year, it's too soon, because then there wouldn't be a book for years. Um, so that'll be out next year. And then that new book, and I'll start working on that at the end of the year. I mean, it's not, I do work very hard, far ahead of time because I have so much TV to stay on top of that I have to, where the books will just, you know, I'll, I'll end up missing deadlines. Um, so by the end of this year, I'll start writing the book for 2023. So people say to me, I wish you'd write faster. And I'm like, I, I'm writing so fast. I have books ready for the next year. But the problem is it's not, it's not, it's not my speed at writing. Yeah. It's the speed at which they're releasing to shops. And, and shops don't tend to want the same books from, you know, the same authors. They don't want the same author just sending them books after books. They want different books. Um, so I'm, I'm afraid they have to stay in my mind palace <laughs> until the shops are ready to take them. <laughs> so this will be the biggest gap between the perfect lie now and the drowning. It's going to be a, people are going to have withdrawal symptoms, I think. How do you keep hold of ideas in your mind palace then? If it's such a long lead time and you've got ideas already. It is. I mean, I that book for 2023, I have um, pretty much sketched out just in a Word document. I, I saved them somewhere and I have them ready to go for when I have the time to sit down and go back to it. So I, I kind of take it out of my mind and I put it on paper, just the genesis of the idea. And then when I have time for it, I'll actually sit down and work it out properly, you know. But I, I write them down quickly because I'm always frightened I'm going to forget that idea, particularly if it comes to me kind of in a semi dream or if I'm in the middle of something else. I'm like, I better get this down yeah. before it goes. And um, so I have a kind of a folder with ideas for future books and future TV shows sitting on the computer. And I get around to them all in the end, like, I hope that I get to keep writing for many decades to come. Well, I definitely hope so. Um, I'd just like to say thank you so much for tonight and um I, I really hope that the audience enjoy the book as much as i did yeah me too thanks so much for having me alex no problem and uh hopefully i'll see you in how you, if not if not this year next year because I, I know that you're going to struggle to get there this year so next year hopefully. Yeah. hopefully next year yeah thank you and uh 
hopefully the talk, the rest of the talk goes well. I, I'm just nearly done on this now. We've got a few more events um, and then the book has to stand on its own. So hopefully people buy it and tell their friends and their family if they enjoy it. And that's how books become successful. Yeah, I'm sure they will. Because I loved it. So thank you. Um, next week, guys, um, um, I'll be uh, having a week off. But then... Um, on the 7th of next month, I've got to stay at Pierce. June, yeah. I keep forgetting what month we're on because I've been locked down that long. Um, I'm just going to sh sh shut it down now, guys. And uh, I see you all in a fortnight. Thank you. Yeah. It's just there. Uh, Still. So then...